back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. As we continue our discussion of the relatively unremarkable president of the Gilded Age, we now turn to a discussion of the only man to hold the presidency for two separate terms, Grover Cleveland. Cleveland was both the 22nd and 24th president. In the election of 1888, he lost the electoral vote to Benjamin Harrison, but won the popular vote by more than 100,000. Also, he prevailed in 1884 in one of the narrowest popular margins ever, only about 30,000 votes. Cleveland rose to the White House from virtual obscurity. He was a lawyer from Buffalo in the early 1880s with little ambition. At 44 years of age, he was a bachelor. By presidential standards, he was considered coarse. He hung out with the boys, went to saloons and racetracks, and spent his weekends hunting and fishing. He was not particularly intellectual. He also had some skeletons in his closet. During the Civil War, he had hired a substitute after being drafted. This in an era when most presidents and many other politicians had served in the war. He had also fathered an illegitimate child. In explaining Cleveland's rise to the presidency, one commentator said he was lucky, almost unbelievably lucky. In 1881, a group in Buffalo sought a candidate for mayor with a clean record. This was an era of corrupt politics, and they hit upon Grover Cleveland, serving at the time as sheriff in Buffalo. He was easily elected. Cleveland upheld an honest government. He opposed graft and corruption. He frequently vetoed bills that he found wasteful. And he soon became known as the veto mayor, quickly finding himself being considered as a candidate for the governor of New York, as he was free from association with Tammany Hall and the machine politicians of the age. In November of 1882, Cleveland was elected the governor of New York. He was a very successful governor, maintaining his policies as mayor. He was unafraid to veto bills that he didn't believe in. He also fought Tammany Hall and refused to grant patronage to members of the New York political machine. Within a matter of only a few months, he was being considered as a candidate for the presidency. As governor of the major state of New York, and with a record of battling against corruption in government, he was a natural candidate. He was nominated on the second ballot. The Republican nominee was James G. Blaine. He had been Speaker of the House, a Senator, and Secretary of State. He was perhaps the most well-known politician of the day. Blaine was colorful and interesting, and over his long career had been touched by several corrupt schemes. Democrats preyed on that flaw during the campaign, emphasizing Cleveland's integrity. Republicans countered by calling Cleveland the hangman of Buffalo because as sheriff he had personally executed two men. They also exposed his fathering of an illegitimate child, saying, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. In the closest election to that point, Cleveland prevailed largely by winning his home state of New York. The popular majority there was only about 1,200 votes. Cleveland's first term was honest, conservative, and unimaginative. He generally appointed capable men who did unexciting things. As the first Democrat in the White House since before the Civil War, Cleveland appointed Southerners to a number of high posts and many lesser posts. Because he was the first Democrat president in a generation, there was great call for him to replace officials and appoint his own. Eventually, he settled on a policy that no one would be fired without cause. Still, the task of making appointments consumed much of his time. In terms of philosophy, Cleveland held a narrow view of presidential powers. He didn't believe in meddling in congressional affairs, which was also a convenient way for him to avoid getting mixed up in complex or difficult issues. 
As such, Cleveland had little influence with the important legislation passed during his term, including the Dawes Severalty Act of 1887, which divided Indian territory among individuals and also granted them citizenship. He was generally an uninspiring president. Many of the tasks of his job bored him. He didn't get along well with Congress and refused to participate in the customary give and take that goes along with creating policy. He also resented reporters, mostly for their probing questions. He was a bit of a loner in the White House, although his marriage in 1886 changed that. Cleveland inherited the complex issue of currency. He proposed to stop the coining of silver, and the bill was defeated in the Senate, and so the tariff became a major issue in the election of 